Welcome to History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor, Greg Jackson, and today we take a brief respite from our usual story-driven telling of American history to have a very interesting conversation with a dear friend of mine who happens to be an expert on the law of war. And given that we've recently discussed General Order 100 in the Philippines, I thought that this was the perfect time to bring Professor Ryan Vogel to History That Doesn't Suck. Ryan, do you mind saying hello to, to the good people? Hello there. Happy to be here. Ryan, let me uh, get your impressive credentials out there so that everyone knows just what a pro you are. You earned your law degrees, not degree, but degrees, <laughs> as one does, uh, from American University and Georgetown. After that, you spent a decade, roughly, in Washington, D.C., working for the federal government, where you advised the Secretary of Defense and spent several years bouncing mostly at the Department of Defense, but you did a year with Department of State, and you've been to Guantanamo. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Many times, I, actually. And I'll just leave. No, you, you were there again in an, in an advising role on right. uh, legalities and detention. So you've had a very fascinating career before, of course, getting to your true pinnacle, <laughs> which was found becoming the founding director of the Center for National Security Studies at Utah Valley University and uh, continue to teach courses on uh, the law of war, uh, which you've done at other universities before coming here. And I, I understand you have amazing colleagues now. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a few in particular. Right. Right. So all that said, Professor Vogel. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining me. Of course. All right. So as I queued up and as attentive listeners will know from the last episode, General Order 100 came up during the Philippine-American War or the Philippine War or the <laughs> insurrection, all legal terms that we can kind of dive into at some point. But as that came up, General Order 100, everyone listening should remember that it originates from the Civil War and it codified the rules of engagement. But let's go back a click even before that. Can you tell us why was this even needed? I mean, what was warfare like before this Abe Lincoln signed 1863 order? Right. And it's a great question because before order number 100, there were no codified written down laws of war. What you had was customs and usages and norms that had existed and had developed over centuries. So you go way back and you have things like the just war doctrine or just war theory that originated in the, the Christian tradition, or you had the Sharia law that talked about different aspects of how prisoners should be treated and what tactics can be used against certain types of people during warfare. You have what you see over time is a whole history of development um, of the law of war. And by by the time you get to the 1700s, 1800s, you start to have more of a established custom and tradition there, but still no codified law, still no treaty out there like we have today. Right. I mean, as you say that, you know, I think through some of the courses I teach and things that we've, well, we've discussed as well at other times on campus, my mind initially goes to, you mentioned Sharia, I think of Muhammad in 630 when he takes Mecca and by the tribal laws that were essentially you know, in, in effect uh, at that time, he had the right to make everyone in the city his slave, and he chose not to do that. That's part of uh, what one of the big keystone, you know, aspects of, of the last last few years of Muhammad's life. He dies two years after that, but it was a big deal because he broke from what was the norm and what, by our thoughts today, would you know not be okay, right? You, we wouldn't imagine a an army that's winning and slaving the city. And yet this was a, a very noteworthy, different thing for him to say, hey guys, you know what we're not gonna do? Enslave the people that we've defeated. Yeah, and the, and, and the law that came from that tradition was in many ways more progressive than the European traditions that existed at the same time. The codes of chivalry, um, which were mostly codes that protected, norms that protected knights fighting against other knights, but didn't protect the you know the the other classes including of course the enemy right didn't right. wouldn't um include protecting the enemy so in a way the traditions that came from muhammad and the islamic law were more ahead of where 
European laws would be at around that same time. Sure. And as you mentioned that, I, I do think about I mean, part of the Crusades was actually wanting <laughs> European monarchs wanting to get troublesome knights out of Europe. Right. Uh, that was that was all part of the gig. And right. when they got to the Middle East, it was uh, kind of a no holds bar. Um, OK, so we've got norms. It's uh, like the Pirates movies uh, from Disney, right? It's <laughs> guidelines. Yeah. R- right? Loose, okay. loose guidelines. Well, and, and importantly, and I think we'll, we'll cover this too, the, the guidelines only covered certain classes of people. Even into the 1700s, 1800s, there were whole classes of people that just were not protected by any sort of norm and custom. And that includes people that were not affiliated with a state, you know, a state actor. They weren't part of a state military. Sometimes that would even be people that didn't fight like a state military. So guerrillas and, and um, you know, a- other insurgent type groups. Well, as you say that, my thoughts go to the American Revolution. Right. Right. So we've got our colonial Minutemen and and uh, you know, made, made famous, I guess you could say, in more in the last, what, uh, decade or two by... Mel Gibson's film, The Patriot, <laughs> which I'm going to go ahead and say is not the the film you want to watch for historical <laughs> accuracy. Uh, but they definitely make a big to-do out of that. Mel Gibson single-handedly wipes out a you know whole British unit, as one does. As one does. Yes, just, you know, <laughs> trees apparently are, <laughs> are all you need, and, and you can do that. Um, so the, the British, I mean, they would have looked at, they did. They looked at the colonists and, and said, you're, you're not fighting fair. Right. Right. They they viewed them as unchivalrous. Um, they viewed them as even uncivilized for engaging in what we would call guerrilla warfare um, and other, again, in our, our modern language, we'd call them asymmetric approaches. Basically, the approaches that a weaker opponent would use in order to fight a more sophisticated and superior enemy, which is, you know, what the British Empire was compared to the American colonies back in the 1770s. All right. So clearly we're establishing what we're talking we're talking tradition. We're talking, yeah, customs. Yes, nothing norms. That's totally set in stone. Nope. And and that is why um, Lincoln goes to Franz Lieber, who is a professor at Princeton University, and says, "Hey, uh, we need something that is uh, tangible. We need we need you to go out and collect these customs and norms that exist out there. He's not making these things up. He's gathering them and putting them in a single document. And Lincoln has a variety of reasons to do this. One, he wants some discipline and, um, you know, the upper hand, the moral high ground in the war against the the South. But also it's something to show to the outside world, right? That we're, we're a country that's ahead. You know, we're we're a country that's forging new ground. And this is something that exists out there in theory, but we're putting it into practice in our own military doctrine. Okay, now I want to go deeper on that, but before we do, can we go a little bit deeper on our boy Franz? Yeah. Professor yeah. Lieber. Yeah. Uh, why is Lincoln going to this guy? Well, he he comes from this tradition. He himself fought in the Napoleonic Wars. He had seen war up close and personal. He had sons that were engaged in the Civil War. Yeah, one on the Union side, one on the South side, not uh, terribly uncommon in those days. Sure. One of them was killed in action. The other one was gravely wounded. Another son goes on to become the uh, judge advocate general for the U.S. Army. Um, so he he is steeped in, in this mix. tradition. He's in the <laughs> mix. It's personal to him. Yeah. Um, but he also comes from that Germanic tradition of of total war. You know, this idea that war is hell and that it should be. It should be hell. Because what what the Germanic tradition uh, espoused was that if you made war too humane, it would be more common. If you made war atrocious and horrific, then it would be less common. And whether that's true or not, this was a a tradition um, that a lot of legal uh, law of war theorists at the time espoused, and, and he was definitely one of them. Well, now, as you mentioned that, it does draw my mind back to the Napoleonic Wars, which you mentioned that he fought in, and it's probably worth noting. I mean, th- these wars, they start with the French Revolution, and some of my listeners will remember the episode on the Statue of Liberty, and I indulged my French history a little bit. We did talk a titch about it, but those wars, which start with Europe essentially, well, the monarchs of Europe descending on France, because the last thing they can let their own peasant population learn is that French peasants could overthrow their monarch right. and establish a republic. and 
that that's not a good look. That's a, a rascally model to exactly. allow. Exactly. So the the monarchs of Europe, by and large, attacked France, and then of course, France had a, a general who kind of got a little aggressive himself after the fact, and Napoleon, and that bled into the Napoleonic Wars. So from the 1790s all the way up until 1815, Europe is just a battlefield, right. and so it is the total war that you're talking about. It's devastating, and that's where we have a a very significant peace in 1815 in Vienna, where the five great powers of Europe, France, Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria. In fact, I, I will note briefly, the Holy Roman Empire has ceased to exist. Napoleon has stamped it out of existence. Yeah. And, and that's, again, a Germanic, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is neither holy nor Roman. <laughs> Not really even an empire. That's that's kind of a longstanding joke amongst historians. Wish I could take credit for that one, but you know, feel, feel I should own that. Uh, point being, it's radically changed Europe. It's been absolutely devastating in, in terms of the the total war that was waged. Um, so Vienna is this great massive peace, partly to really never want to see that sort of war again. Everyone right. who's sitting down, there's no romanticized notions of what war is. And they redraw the map of Europe in such a way as to balance. This is their, the, we're talking, sorry, I don't want to get too way too far away from the legal stuff, but... Uh, just to kind of set up a little bit more where, where Franz is coming from, uh, th they set up a balance between the five great powers that, in theory, they hope will prevent any one empire from ever emerging as a superpower that can lead the continent into war yeah. again. Well, and it's important history, too, because usually when you get developments in the law of war, it's because there's been some horrific war or uh, or series of wars that that really grabs the attention of people and uh, it, with with what exactly what you said which is we can't have this happen again right i mean it, most recently in the aftermath of world war 2 you get the 1949 geneva conventions but well before that the hague regulations and the early versions of the geneva conventions and and these these other events they come from the aftermath of conflicts that were deemed too horrific to allow to happen again right um, and and so the napoleonic wars are part of that tradition. Um, it's interesting for Americans when you when you talk about the beginning of the development of the law of war. It's Order Number One Hundred, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah. If you talk to Europeans, it's the Battle of Solferino. You had a Swiss businessman who was just happened to be traveling through uh, the Italian countryside and happened and and was in uh, Solferino during the time of a major skirmish there it affected him in a profound way. And so he wrote a book about it and it roughly equivalent, I guess, in in just sheer influence on the European continent to Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin here in the United States. Everyone's read it. Everyone's aware of it. Um, the the book was called In Memory of Solferino. And it is it kickstarts what would be called the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Committee of the Red Cross Movement. So that happens at the same time that across the sea, you're getting order number 100 and the American Civil War. And so you have these two traditions that are largely concerned with the same thing, which is governing warfare, right? How do we make warfare more humane, more respectful of not only the combatants, but the civilians that are affected by it? Um, and you have these two traditions happening or starting at the same time on both sides of the pond. Okay, that's all fascinating to me. Uh, the Battle of Solferino, you know, we're now tapping into the, well, the movement towards Italian unification. That doesn't happen until 1870. But what I find fascinating about all of this is the piece that I'd mentioned a little bit earlier in 1815, Vienna. That's the start of the concert of Europe. And 19th century Europe is, well, it's considered by and large to be a century of peace, more or less. Uh, yeah, wars here and there, but for Europe, <laughs> yeah, for war torn Europe, this is this is a century of peace until World War One. Yeah, but nationalism is driving a few wars here and there as Italy is cobbling itself from small principalities and kingdoms into what will eventually become the nation state. Same things happening with a number of small little Germanic principalities and the Kingdom of Prussia. It's going to turn into what we now know as uh, the state of Germany. Right, it, but it's it's fascinating to to see that even in this lull of total war, the intellectual development, I guess it's it's there, it's on both sides of yeah. the Atlantic, and here we go toward 
this greater codification. And the galvanizing thing here is that Henri Dunant, who's the one who writes this book, this, this Swiss businessman, writes it in such graphic detail. I would commend it to your, your audience. You know, it's, it's a pretty brief um, description, but it is graphic. And I think it jarred a lot of Europeans from thinking that war is glorious, war is, you know, something that, um, you know, ha has noble purposes. Uh, it jars them from that thinking into, my gosh, this is really terrible and we need to do something about it. And really, the Red Cross movement starts mostly as kind of a relief society, right? Like they put together these groups to go to the battlefield after the fact and tend to the injured soldiers and bring them relief. Later on, the Geneva Conventions that come from that tradition will focus more on constraints or restraints during warfare. But it has, that, it has its origins in just this desire to bring relief to the suffering soldiers and, and those left behind on the battlefield. Fascinating. And uh, the timing on all that for me, I'm, I'm again just thinking it's, it's been a few decades since Napoleon. We're back to where, I mean, that's the pattern that I see as a historian. You have these massive, brutal, awful wars, and then you have a generation of people who, you know, whether they personally fought in it or not, yeah. they know someone who's been devastated. They have been devastated by loss. Right. But you get a few decades away and people forget, people forget, and they start thinking, you know, we, we, can, we can solve all of our problems with things that go boom. Right. Okay. So we see the codification happening. We, we see its value. Um, I think it's time for us to maybe shift into the late 19th century here. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. head towards the Philippines, shall we? Okay. So we get the significance of General Order 100. It's clearly laudable. It's noteworthy uh, in its step of building an actual law of war, not just guidelines. Right. Yet, when we get to the Philippines, uh, the, the Philippine War at the end of the 19th century, General Order 100 comes up not in the context of regulating war, but of increased harshness and, frankly, even death aimed at Filipino fighters. That feels a little, a little quirky, yeah, a little, a little, a little inconsistent. Odd. Yeah. Um, Let's dig in here, yeah, shall we? Yeah. I, the, the thing that you have to understand about Order Number 100 is that much like the rest of the custom and norms and traditions that are out there, and this is where we started at the beginning, this protects certain people from certain groups, but it does, it's not a blanket protection. So when the United States goes to war in the Philippines, it does not view them as an equal opponent. It views them as you know, the same category that the British viewed us in, in some sense, except that we don't have that familial um, connection, right? The Filipinos are a different people on the other side of the planet, and they we are not giving them the status of equals in warfare. What we would call it is they're not, they're not given belligerent status. They're not, they're not given combatant status. They're treated as insurgents, as guerrillas, as non-state actors, and those people are not protected. So order number 100 is not really going to matter in that context. It's not it's certainly not going to restrain American forces from using the kind of interrogation techniques or, you know, in imprisonment techniques that, you know, they deemed necessary. So general order 100 it does state limitations as to things that are permitted to be done to civilians to well to the opponent, to the foe, the enemy. Um I found interesting uh, as I was writing episode 107 and uh, on the Philippines and reading through General Order 100, the comparison to pirates yeah. of the, uh, you know, right. of those who inconsistently, I believe was, if that wasn't the word, it was close to that. People that basically engaged in combat, but then didn't. Right. Uh, right. And they kind of this back and forth, right. which is what right. we typically think of a as a guerrilla were, were there any other groups beyond that that would, would really be kind of targeted? Or is this kind of still falling under the, the guise of where we would think of like spies traditionally, which today spies have more protection, but it, earlier on. Right. No protection. Right. I mean, Nathan, right. Nathan Hale, to go back to the revolution, this famous yeah. right uh, American hero killed because he's a spy. Right. But we don't even need to look that far back. Um, you know, we don't even need to look for analogies to other state actors we treated American Indians the exact same way in the wars 
conquering the the western part of the United States. We treated them as insurgents. We treated them as not equal combatants. Again, inconsistently, because there are a few court cases that were covered over the last hundred years that did treat them with state-like status. Um, you have a, a famous case where one of the American Indian fighters um, that kills an American soldier is apprehended and brought to court, and the court finds that this is a war. This is a war between state actors. There was a treaty between those two, and we recognized them as a separate nation. But that was the exception to the broader rule, which was that American Indians were treated much like the Filipinos were as as unequals on the battlefield. So what you're saying it's it's consistent with Silby's book. I actually cited that one in the the that last episode on the Philippine American War, where he basically said or you know suggested that the U.S. military <laughs> cut its teeth more or less on how to fight in the Philippines through manifest destiny mm-hmm. and, and fighting right uh, the the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Absolutely, and and, and not just. Um, in terms of, you know, military operations, in terms of legal status and, and, you know, legal theory, how we conceptualize. At the beginning of this episode, you noted that, you know, what do we call this? Do we call this the Philippine insurrection? We do call it the U.S.-Philippines war, something like that. Those, those terms matter uh, because if it is a war between the U.S. and the Philippines and that we think of the Philippines as a separate country, then they're deserving of a higher status, you know, of the status as equals on the battlefield, as combatants. If we think of it as an insurrection, you have a whole different thing. Well, and uh, the military leaders back to D.C., President uh, McKinley, they all insisted insurgent. That was the word to be right. used. You, you did not just dis- that um, those writing their reports, they were not to right. describe. And that was very purposeful. Yes, Right. Yeah. And with legal purpose, right. specifically, as, as you're pointing out here. It provides a lot more flexibility when it comes to detention, when it comes to interrogation, when it comes to trial, you know, uh, targeting. I mean, all the kinds of things that you would want flexibility on from the military perspective, especially in an age where there's not, you know, e- even into the late 1800s, early 1900s, there's still quite a bit of flexibility with the rules governing armed conflict, and especially when it comes to parties that are not of equal status. Well, as you were talking, that was the, I mean, I feel like I know the answer here, but I, I would love to hear you say it. <laughs> um, I mean, General o- Order 100 being as groundbreaking as it was in the 1860s. I mean, at this point in the development of, of world history, yeah. uh, we really don't have anything beyond General Order 100 that would apply in this situation, right? There, there's not much by way of... No. I mean, we haven't created even, you know, the League of Nations to fail yet, right? Uh, right? Uh, th- these larger global organizations that we know of and think of today uh, that might rein in what a nation's doing here, there. Here's the crazy thing, though, and we're not, we're not going to get into more modern history, at least not yet, no, maybe no. in a future yeah. episode, but we still have not figured that out completely. I mean, the the law still has major gaps when it comes to non-state actors. So even today in, you know, 2022, we've got all these wars behind us fought with terrorist groups and insurgents and insurrectionists and other non-state actor type groups. We still don't have the same kind of legal tradition that matches what we have for wars with state actors. So far from having our act together today, we're still, we're still kind of, you know, floundering around trying to figure out what's appropriate and what analogies we should use. And, you know, what's, what's the right uh, way of balancing necessity and, you know, humanitarianism and all these kinds of things, right? Uh, The, the, the the real grappling uh, we're still in it. Well, in 200, 300 years from now, historians will look back and say, man, can you believe they still didn't right. Know what they were doing. Uh, You know, (sighs) I'd, I'd like to, because I, I know people want to better understand this. I think we, we need to talk about the water cure, but yeah. let's go ahead and take a quick break. And right when we come back, we'll pick up that. And we're back. Professor Vogel, you haven't you haven't left my little dungeon recording studio <laughs> here. Thank you for still being here. Um, the water cure. 
Or waterboarding, to use the, right. the more <laughs> up-to-date term. Up-to-date term, yeah. yeah. Um, thoughts. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the, the, the most lighthearted way I can, you're right. I can lead into take that. us into that one. Uh, so, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, l- lay the ground here a little bit. The, the water cure, as it's described in a, a letter home uh, from a U.S. serviceman, th- they would take detainees... Uh, in the Philippines, and one U.S. soldier would stand on each appendage, essentially. So a five-man team here. A stick would be placed in the detainee's mouth, and then they would pour a bucket of water on them. Right. And uh, do this until they were convinced they were getting the information that they wanted. Which, Which I should note, the water cure, as practiced in that day and age was a much more physical interrogation technique than waterboarding would be a century later. And, and, and the major difference there is waterboarding, which is similarly a, a form of torture. So let's not, you know, let's not Yeah, I didn't that. think you were, you were no, here definitely saying, not no, 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 apologize. but you know, wa- right? waterboarding's totally fine, guys. That's, yeah, but I, waterboarding, I didn't see going there. It's more of a mental um, form of torture because it's a simulated drowning. Typically with waterboarding, you're going to have a cloth over the mouth and you're going to bore buckets of water so that the person feels like they're drowning. Um, not that they're actually filling up with water the way that the water cure was practiced back, you know, a hundred years before it. So right. similar, there, there, there are similarities between them. Um, and like I said, both would be forms of, of torture and, and highly illegal under, any sort of prisoner of war interrogation technique, but um, but but different a little bit. Well, I think that alone uh, <laughs> is quite the interesting bit. Uh, so we definitely have torture on our hands here. That's that's what the primary sources themselves right. say. The the soldiers riding home say this is a this is a horrific torture. So when is this? As we talk about the codification of the law of war, when is this starting to sink in more with the U.S. population to think? Uh, this or or other forms of behavior, uh, because there are also, you know, instances of uh, beatings and th- things of that nature to try and get detainees to yeah. uh, to talk. When does more of this start to really, you know, enter into the the discussion about the conduct of war? Yeah, it, 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 and again, the answer is a bit mixed here um, because there had been recognition that combatants, that state actors, state military especially officers, you know, as opposed to enlisted folks, um, were due respect and honor, you know, that they were instruments of their state. They had done nothing wrong themselves. So they were supposed to be protected and respected, um, given all kind of recognition of their their status. That did not exist, though, for the t- people that we're talking about here. So that, that important, the important question always goes back to how do we qualify or characterize the the status of the conflict how do we characterize the status of the groups that are fighting it if you say you're you're fighting an insurrection against an insurgent group you're you are blanket uh characterizing them in a way that's not going to protect them as prisoners of war right so right. that that's one part i mean certainly even those that were uh kept as prisoners of war we've had lots of abuses over the years you probably talked a bit about andersonville during the civil war and and just the rampant abuses and the uh, consequent deaths of soldiers that were in prisoner of war camps but but by the 1800s and into the 1900s there's certainly a movement um, toward protecting and and having even uh, mechanisms to ensure the protection of prisoners of war that are being held by the opposite side. It's just that those don't apply to groups that we don't characterize as as equals on the battlefield. So what do we make then of Howling Wilderness Smith? Uh, If if you recall, General Jacob H. Smith, he's the commander of the the 6th Brigade, and he goes to an old haunt of yours, in fact. Right. Right. The, the Alamo. Samar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which I, I didn't mention in the, in your biography. I mean, fun side note, you just happen to speak Tagalog and have lived in the Philippines. And, That's right. Yeah. No biggie. Been to a lot of the places that you talked about in your last episode. And you definitely helped my pronunciation <laughs> on a number of those places. And I thank you again. So he does get pulled before a court martial and he is found guilty of- right. 
uh, you know, of having abused power, having gone beyond what's acceptable. Right. I mean, where, where does I realize? Look, I'm I'm the historian. It's fine. You know, you're you're the legal counsel here. I, what are your thoughts as we think through how General Order 100 really does not provide protection to the Filipinos in this context? And yet here we have a court martial, and he is found guilty yeah. of the important distinction here is that it does not protect the combatants, but it does still protect civilians, right? So the general civilian population in the Philippines is going to be broadly protected by General Order Number 100. The fighters, on the other hand, will not be protected, at least not protected in the same way, right? They're not going to be given prisoner of war protections. They're not going to be getting, given the honor um, and the status of equal combatants on the battlefield. So that is not going to happen. But where what you happen here in the incident that you're bringing up is is the um, order to kill all the people above a certain age and those 10 years old, 10 years old. So they're still in minor status, right? There's, there's no question. It's not like 16, you know, where you might have people that are in their culture, um, you know, more part of the fighting force, right? You're, you're not, there's no blurriness there. 10 years old, you know, you're talking about children here and under order number 100 civilians are protected. They cannot be made the object of attack. Um, that, Tradition continues through this day in a more codified form, um, but that is one of the fundamental protections under the law of war is that you do not target civilians and children are especially protected civilians. Now, I know you've come across this scenario, not asking you to name names or talk about specific instances, uh, but as Howling Wilderness Smith right, right. Uh, called that for having said, turn the island Samar into a Howling Wilderness He was very quick to say during his court-martial that he was following orders, that he was given the indication from General Chafee that this is what what General Chafee wanted. That is the same claim Uh that the defendants in the Nuremberg trial claimed, right? They they claimed we were only following orders. And what we learned from Nuremberg, which is what we knew before, is that claiming that you're following orders is not a defense to war crimes. And targeting civilians is one of the most fundamental types of war crimes. We saw the same thing in the Vietnam context where you had a number of cases. The most noteworthy was Lieutenant Cowley, um, who's part of the My Lai massacre, right. um, who also claimed the same thing. I was following orders and, uh, you know, it's not a defense, not a defense to war crimes. He also was convicted. And you fast forward even to, you know, the most recent wars, the Abu Ghraib scandal. And it was the same kind of thing. The fact that there are those above the people that are actually prosecuted that were part of the plan or guilty in some way, even if it's a culture of, you know, lack of discipline or something like that, does not does not negate the accountability for the person in question, right? So right. It, we're, we're certainly not saying that those people um, should not be held accountable in some way, but we're just saying that you cannot use uh, following orders as a defense to committing war crimes, that, or it all breaks down. The whole system breaks down. That you do, as an officer, have an obligation to stand by morals and, frankly, reject an order if that is right. And that's partly case. why you have things like Order Number One Hundred. Is it's there? You you are beholden to to that order. Uh, when you are in the military today, you are aware of what the Geneva Conventions require. You're aver- aware of the law of war. You get training on that. I mean, typically, you'll get training above and beyond that because the the rules of engagement will always be stricter than the, our legal obligations. So when when soldiers or other uh, members of the military are engaging in in military operations, they're they're very aware of the guidelines, you know, the rules that that govern it. So they are required to follow those, even if an order um, comes in contrary to it. They're they're still required to follow the law and follow the regulations that they've been given. Okay. Now I want to be going to use my scalpel here with this next line of line of questioning, sir. Um, I think it's important to note the historiography, which is the historian's term for the history of historians writing about a, a moment. It's a it's a little meta, yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, where the historiography is at for the for the Philippine American War currently is uh, that you have some excellent historians who are pointing out that, yes, the the narrative of the com- compassionate imperialist power of the United States uh, helping 
its quote unquote little brown brother to use Taft's term for the Filipino people. Uh, that's bunk. That's BS. And at the same time, what, what they've been noting of, of late is that the pendulum has kind of swung a little bit to where there's, and this is where, you know, I want, I always want to be very careful on what we're saying here. It's not to dismiss these atrocities, but that sometimes it's, it's lost that these atrocities are in fact more widespread, uh, in this era than, well, then I think we're all comfortable acknowledging. That's uh, definitely true. So within that context, you know, I, I'm by no means looking to paint a broad brush and say that that the actions of of Smith, of Howling Wilderness Smith, reflects all of the servicemen, as uh, as my fellow historians are are also you know noting of late. Um, all that said, okay, I laid my groundwork. <laughs> to what extent? Uh, and I realize we're, we're getting a little bit um, speculative, but I, I think th- this is a space that you've probably had to engage in and think through in your career. Uh, to what extent might we consider or be concerned that his court martial was, um, well, potentially more of a scapegoat situation yeah. of we're, we're going to let him be the fall man and kind of sweep other big players under the rug or, you know, do, would conversely, would you say the U.S. military is actually pretty good at really pinpointing bad actors and bringing them to bear? Yeah. To take take of that. Do what what you will with it. I think that's a really interesting question. It's also a very difficult question. <laughs> I know it um, is. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and and only because um, you're you're always going to have, I think, instances where you select cases that you actually want to fight right when when, uh cases are brought to trial it's typically because there's more evidence for a prosecution for a successful prosecution um and so it it doesn't always mean that these are all the cases of abuse these are the ones that we think we can prosecute successfully yeah you also have just a general kind of tradition of and not not just in this country but just in in general of um, higher ranking officials, especially on the civilian side, that are not held accountable in the same way that military officers are. I think the U.S. military is actually very good at holding their military members accountable in military courts. I think we have a very strong legal system in the U.S. military. I'm not expert on whether that same tradition existed back in the sure, late 1800s sure. or early 1900s, but I can say that having seen it very up close, I think, you know, we're, we're good at it. We are not perfect at it. That's, you know, that's for sure. Um, well, and, and, and again, civilians tend to not be swept in the same way. Just, there just aren't the same kind of mechanisms for accountability that exist in the military. Well, and, uh, it's it's not that you ever want to say that any of this is is okay, uh, but you will always be disappointed if you're looking for perfection. Oh yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, well anything, but especially something as messy as as warfare. Yeah, it's di- and it, and it is very difficult, and I know it's unsatisfactory to a lot of people, and I totally understand that. Right. Um, but you have to. You you have to understand how difficult it is just to collect evidence, you know, just just that one aspect, evidentiary sure. collection on the battlefield. You know, if someone has done something um, that, uh, you know, prompts questions, it's it's a difficult thing to establish that. And again, you know, we're, we're both saying the same thing. That's not to excuse or anything. It's no, just to help. I think people understand that. It's a it's a much more difficult context than civilian life, you know, where there's more normalcy. There's the ability to go after usually yeah. um, after the fact and collect evidence and you know um, interview witnesses and things like that. And and you know that doesn't always exist in this context. Sure, and it's only that much more difficult when you think about the lack of technology compared to what we right. have today. Right, right, right. Uh, there are no cameras capturing anything right in the in no the Philippines. what you have is and, and you've referenced this a yeah. few times you have people that will self-incriminate and sometimes that's the the easiest you know those easiest cases is right. when people write home and uh describe the things that they've done you know these are first-hand accounts and in some ways self-incriminating accounts of of the abuses or 
you know, other illegalities that they've committed. Is that ever, and just tell me if this is beyond your experience, it's, it's fine, but is that, well, not ever, but should I say often lost on the self-incriminating? Do, I mean, when they send these things, is is it more, uh, do you see people who, who don't realize like they're so deep into what they're doing that they're not thinking about how awful it is, or is it that they just genuinely think that they're writing to somebody and it's going to stay close hold? I think it's a little of both. Um, you still see it in the same, you know, you still you still see it today. Sure, uh, people will post videos, photographs. From, yeah, the <laughs> photograph. You know, all of those pictures. In fact, the way that we really found out what's happening in Abu Ghraib uh, in Iraq was that people were taking pictures and they were swapping them and, you know, and, and sharing them around. A lot of the abuse that happened there, we documented because they documented themselves doing it. I mean, you know, we could talk all day about the Nazis documenting their own abuses during World War II. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times it's because of um, this perception that they will be um, or they won't be held accountable for the kinds of things that are happening. And sometimes that's a cultural, you know, disciplinary problem within a unit or, you know, the larger um, organization. And sometimes it's bad apples and, you know, sometimes it's a mix of both. Jeez. Okay. I want to get into a few of the lessons that should really be taken from uh, the Philippine-American War. But let's go ahead and take one more break and then we'll come back. And welcome back. Still here with my dear friend, Professor Vogel. Thank you again. Of course. Uh, so, all right, Ryan. We've kind of touched here and there, well, on all sorts of centuries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've pressed well beyond <laughs> the Philippine War. But that said, let's, uh, on a more formal note, and, and not to get too far ahead of things as HTDS has the whole 20th century yet to come, but does the Philippine War inspire any further evolution of the law of war, uh, be that immediately or down the road. Does the U.S. learn important lessons here or does it fail to learn the lessons it should have? What are your thoughts on these things? It's a mixed bag. Um, okay. In some ways, I think we see the law of war continue to develop in a way that protects more people. And the U.S. is is definitely in a leadership position on that de on that development. I'm not sure that it was this war that inspired it. I think it were it was later wars, especially the world wars, that really starts to push that forward. Interestingly, it really is the more modern wars against terrorist groups that forces us to look backward legally on this conflict in particular. And that's because we're starting to think through how do we treat terrorists? How do we how do we conceptualize what they are? Are they are they states? Do we treat them like states? In Vietnam, we treated the Viet Cong as a an equal on the battlefield. We treated them with combatant status, gave them prisoner of war protections. But we don't do that for terrorists. In a lot of ways, we go back to the language and the concepts and theories that we used during the Philippines. So it really, it's hmm. one of those things where we look backward to see how have we done this in the past? You know, we we went to a foreign country, we fought an insurrection. At least that's, you know, what we yeah, called the, it. The, the, th that was the narrative. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. And we have all these, you know, cases and, and legal doctrines that we'd used in the military to um, navigate that kind of, you know, new environment. And so even even the like the, the terms that we used, unprivileged belligerents or unlawful combatants, they largely come from that tradition. So I, I'm not sure that's a positive development in some ways. I think in other ways, it, it does help us to understand what we're dealing with. But um, it helps us to understand where we're at, even yeah. if it's not necessarily positive. Right. I, okay. I, 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 and this is what I said a few minutes ago, which is we're still grappling with this kind of stuff. Right. You know, we're still trying to figure out on the one hand, how do we treat combatants that fight as non-state actors, no affiliation with a state military? How do we, how do we treat them in a you know, a protected way without incentivizing their participation in the hostilities. Because ultimately, that's what we want to do with the law of war is we want to keep people from fighting on the battlefield. So in some ways, 
States wrote the law. States gave themselves protections, and they said to all the non-state actors, past, present, future, don't do this, right? Don't engage in right. warfare because you won't be protected. We're not going to give you the same level of protections as we're going to give our fellow states, you know, that are writing this law with us. Which also makes sense in terms of, well, wanting to, states wanting to ensure their power as states. Right. Right. The If you don't put up barriers to entry, essentially, yeah. if, I, if I can go ahead and borrow from our friends in econ for a second, <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're not protecting the status of already established states. Right. Right. So then, then the difficult questions come with, well, what about places like the Philippines? Is that a state, you know, in the late 1800s? Is this a, a, a state? I mean, I think you would argue, yes, that it is, but we don't conceive of it as a state back then and we don't afford them the kind of protections. Fast forward, uh, you know, 100 years later and and we also make that same determination with the Taliban. You know, we we decide that the Taliban is not a state, even though they are acting as the government of Afghanistan you know, there, there are some weird things about that. The only three countries in the world recognize the Taliban as the existing government of Afghanistan. And yet they're the de facto government of Afghanistan when we invade in, in 2001, 2002. So we go back to that time. In some ways, we use the lessons that we learned there. In other ways, we don't. Um, it's a mixed bag. But we do definitely continue the tradition of development, um, development of the law of war. And it becomes much more humanitarian. It becomes much more focused on the regulations that would make warfare more humane. Uh, maybe not what Franz Lieber wanted, right? right? And Fr and Franz people is rolling over in his grave, right? He he may not have, you guys have liked what nice. resulted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but the tradition definitely goes that direction, and and. You know, today, I think uh, people back then would not recognize the law of war today. It's It's been so codified, so developed, and in, in many ways, you know, so progressive beyond what those early norms and traditions began. I, I will say, as a historian, it's my sense, as I think about the students, you know, that, that we teach, <laughs> the reality of how brief we have really cared about, uh, even on any level and even to the level that we now do in the present, human rights, civil rights, right. it's frankly quite new in the history of humanity. Right. Yeah. It's a blip. It's a blip on the radar. It's it, uh, frankly, it's terrifyingly. Right. Uh, very short brief. Of, of, a, of a blip. But as you've mentioned, still in progress too. Yes. Uh, because when we talk about law of war protections or human rights protections, we're, we're talking about things that are still contested. We're talking about things that are still interpreted or applied in widely varied ways. I mean, it, it, look at the, the you know, conflicts that we look at today. There's uh, targeting of civilians. And of course, the parties that do that are claiming that they're not. And, you know, so there's, right. there's so much variance in both interpretation and then the actual application of the law that uh, we've made a lot of progress and we are in that you know, that blip right there, but still a lot of room to go. I hope I'm not asking you the same question over. That's not my intention. And just say pass if, if you feel that way. But as I think about, and, you know, I also don't want to get into, uh, I want to keep our focus just on what you do, law, law of war here, um, in your years in DC, you know, I, as a civilian, I don't really recall uh, the Philippine American War coming right. up much within these 21st century contexts that we've discussed a bit, you know, as as a touchstone, as a point of reference. Did that happen a little bit more behind, you know, the Oh, certainly not. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. No. <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's a small group of people um, uh, well, and, and I think there are people that might care about it for different reasons. So if you sure. are a military historian, you're going to know more about it. If you are a, a tactician and someone that studies military strategy, you might look back at that as, as an example of military operations that you can glean some lesson from for law of war people. I think most law of war experts never really looked backward until these most recent wars. So the past 20 years, I think has brought the Philippine American war back into perspective, but no, I, I, one of the things that's always shocking to me is how little I think people both in government, out of government, you know, people that are, uh, 
uh, familiar with American history, how little they know about this period of our history. In fact, there's kind of like a a gap there, I think, at the end of the 19th century, where a lot of Americans, they they go from the Civil War and they fast forward to World War One. you know, oh, and there's... If, if that. It's, <laughs> right. Sometimes it's World War Two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You yeah. have 60 to 80 years that are kind of overlooked, you know, and there's some really important things there. The Philippine-American War is really, in some ways... America's major dalliance with imperialism and colonialism, just a tradition that's totally in conflict with our fundamental values and principles. Um, Something that in the 1770s, I think we could probably never have imagined. I mean, you'd say that with a little bit of reservation because, you know, we did fight the Manifest Destiny Wars throughout our history but a foreign war like going abroad in order to subjugate a a, a separate people was just so out of character for the united states we just didn't even conceive of ourselves that way we weren't we weren't those people we were the people that that happened to well and and those are the very arguments that are being had as the philippine american war is raging and even before well, I mean, a, a hot second before that, the Spanish-American War, right. you know, is only the year prior, the day prior. Right. Um, but, I mean, t- precisely to your point, you have Americans going, "This, h- how on earth is, is this happening? Yeah. How, when did this happen? This is not who we are. Yeah. You know, this is, in, in fact, it's the opposite of who we are. You know, this, we, it, it's, it's almost like acting in complete conflict with your very identity, you know? And I think so for a lot of Americans, it's, it's maybe a moment of history that we like to forget and just gloss over (laughs) because it's, it's a little inconvenient. It's one of those things where I think Americans just prefer to look at, at more of the highlights, but I think it's important. I think it's important for, you know, um, Americans of, of all stripes to understand the detours in American history, you know, and the, the, imperfections in order to improve well you know it's been it's been an interesting and fulfilling last um well over a year now getting past uh the the civil war i I remember uh you know starting to get some emails from from listeners who were really excited to get into the progressive era and then right into world war one as we finished (laughs) civil war and yeah uh you know i i'd I'd write back oh actually we're we're going to be a little while before we get to that. Uh, Some things that happened yeah. in those years. Yeah. And, you know, I, I also think, I think you're absolutely right on the desire to kind of forget a few a few things here and there. Uh, but uh, I'd also say, I mean, it's, you know, my own experience in, in the classroom. Uh, man, when you're told you've got to somehow cover all of U.S. history. Yep. In like a few months. Yeah. Yeah, you hit the highlights. You hit the highlights. Yeah. And, and you don't do uh, America's gawky teenage years. No, no, you don't. I mean, it, and how, how do you how do you skip the Civil War in favor of, you know, some of these other things when so much death and anyhow. So there's a curriculum yeah. issue there as and well. And yet, in some ways, they'll learn about the Civil War, you know? Yeah. Um, in some ways, this period of our history, 1880s into the 1910s, is so formative um, and so important because of the choices that we're making, you know, and then unmaking. I mean, we're right. we're doing both of those things. I think it's really critical that Americans understand that. Well, Ryan, thank you again. You know, it, it's interesting sitting with you doing this interview. Uh, as as you will recall, uh, in, in in case any of, uh, any of the listeners haven't put this together, we, we are colleagues. Our offices are next to each other. <laughs> right next door. Right next door. Uh, though this wasn't the case a few years ago, but I remember sitting in your office. Right, we were just, just chatting. We're hanging out and saying, uh, hey, I'm thinking about this podcast I might want to start. <laughs> and I thought it was a great idea. And you now did. look at it. Yeah. Look at it. You know, I, it's um, been so rewarding for me to watch this become what it has become. Um, from this idea that, you know, we, we had talked about into this, you know, this incredibly successful and, and really influential thing that it's become. And, and, uh, I, I mean, I, it's an honor for me to be on it and to, you know, discuss this with you. We would talk about it in the office anyway, but might as well do it (laughs) for an audience. Well, sure. We'll just continue this conversation over probably some ramen tomorrow. (laughs) It'll be be great. That's right. Exactly. But 
uh, you've built something great here and, um, and it, it really is an honor to, to be a part of it. Well, thank you, sir. I'm of course just digging for compliments, but, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> any time though. Thank you. All right, man, we'll go ahead and call that a wrap. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed getting a little deeper on the law of war and join me in two weeks. When I'd like to tell you a story. History That Doesn't Suck is created and hosted by me, Greg Jackson. Special thanks to today's guest, UVU Center for National Security Studies Director, Brian Vogel. Production by Airship. Sound design by Molly Bach. Theme music composed by Greg Jackson. Arrangement and additional composition by Lindsey Graham of Airship. For bibliography of all primary and secondary sources consulted in writing this episode, visit htdspodcast.com. HTDS is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. My gratitude to you kind souls providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. Annette Avril, Fox Car Barrett, Victoria Bennett, Boosh, Amanda and Kelsey Bragg, Henry Brunges, Will Caldwell, Christopher Cottle, Jason Carstens, Bryce Chaplin, Charles Devier, John Frugal Dougal, Kyle Decker, Bob Drazovich, Joe Dobas, Michael and Rachel Ercolini, Nate Ferrer, Diego Fletis, Andrew Fortunati, Kyle Gensler, Lee Goldman, Jennifer in Houston, Mike Healy, Brad Herman, Noah Hoff, Jeremy James, Melanie Jan, Dex Jones, John Keller, Todd Klein, Amber Clanger, Sue Lang, Aaron Lapellis, Chris Mendoza, Rich Miller, Matthew Mitchell, Michael McWhorter, Jeffrey Moose, Nick Navota, Fox Osborne, Amanda Parker, Christopher Pullman, Sean Reagan, Samuel Sedell, John Schaefer, David and Alexander Sharp, John Savage, Scott Slaymaker, Kirk Samaro, Durante Spencer, Thomas Stewart, Bill Thompson, Stephen Thomas, Sarah Treyway, Brandon Unheim, TJ Walker, and Jeffrey Watts. Join me in two weeks, where I'd like to tell you a story. Thank you.